uh, clinic leads actually going to the room to follow the doctors to see if they, you know, ask questions in certain ways. But, you know, if I have my department head follows me around, I may behave in a different way. You know, so, but, you yeah. know, so one thing, I'm at the risk of sounding provocative, if we call some numbers, you know, they'll say your call is monitored for quality improvement purpose. Uh, how far away are we from that point? And the residents get watched all the time and there, there are rooms rigged with cameras or with audio recordings to provide feedback. And then when physicians are in practice, you know, for lean, you know, once a month or once three months, their department head comes in and follows them around. But what about, you know, in the daily regular practice? I don't have answers, right? I think that just even, even if some, so, so one question is, if someone starts observing me, do I change my behavior? Well, if that's true, at least I'm starting to be conscious of it and go, wow, you know, uh, maybe you get watched once in a while, you'll start remembering when you're not being watched that, hey, I did change something, maybe I need to do that more often. Second is that even when we're doing these studies where we're all recording people, so they are clearly on their best behavior, their best behavior is far short of where it should be. And so they need to be shown that behavior and that has to be interpreted. And, and I think if other people went in that room, if, if you just had something where once a month you went and spent two hours observing another physician, and then uh, I bet there'd be, I, I, I don't know, I'm making it up, but I bet there'd be dramatic changes. Please join me in thanking Thanks. Uh, Peter Ewell for this. Okay, we're getting ready now for our last presentation of the day. It's amazing, it's the end of day two. Uh, Gonzalo Janela, you met him early in the morning, uh, part of the debate. Uh, Gonzalo has been very nice to uh, join us. Um, Gonzalo is a pulmonologist, is, uh, you know, actually takes care of people, takes care of patients, and in his um, other uh, facet, he, is a, he does work in human rights. And we thought it would be remiss, it would be a mistake, if we're in Peru talking about shared decision making, and we don't get to get a, a, a pretty good picture of what is the context in which patients and clinicians interact in this country, particularly from the perspective of that key word that I used on the first day, which is respect. So please uh, join me in welcoming Gonzalo Janela. Okay. Um, again, it's, it's nice to have you all here. You have, uh, I know that you went yesterday to a restaurant, today you had an earthquake, so you're having all the Lima experience. Um, a couple of disclosures. Uh, most of the information that I'm going to use in this presentation is taken from uh, the public reports made by institutions, mostly from the Ombudsman office. Some of them are personal archives and for obvious reasons, the, uh, the pictures that I'm going to show are not uh, real ones, are, are, and, and, and the names that I use are, have been changed. Some of these cases have been judicialized. And uh, what I'm going to, and, and also something that you know, I have worked for the Ombudsman Office between 2005 and 2011. That was the second time that I worked. Before that, I worked in the 90s. Um, and I'm, I'm, I have to recognize that I'm biased in, in, in terms that I'm, I'm for human rights, and, and I have been involved in a lot of things around, around that topic in, in the last few years. Uh, so this talk will be more about what happens in, in Peru and what is the context, and, and I think is, is somebody was asking me yesterday about what is the Peruvian context. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what, what happens in, in our country around healthcare decisions and and things li like that. Um, in November 1997, Rosa, she was completing her 35th week of her, her second pregnancy. 
Uh, she was 35 years old. Uh, she's natural from Huancabelica. So it's a city south in Peru, 3,500 meters over sea level. Her fr first pregnancy ended on a C-section due to severe preeclampsia. This was her second pregnancy. It was not different. Her feet were swollen. Her blood pressure was high. She was getting her uh, prenatal care. But things got complicated. She was having some symptoms, was rushed to the local hospital with severe preeclampsia. On arrival, she fell unconscious, she got seizures, went right away to the operating room to get an emergency C-section. Unfortunately, the baby died a couple of days after. She recovered well, but only to be notified that during the C-section she was surgically sterilized without her consent. When asked, the doctors responsible claimed that this was medically necessary due to her high reproductive risk. In December 1998, Gloria, she was also natural from Huancabelica, was ending her 10th pregnancy. She was from a rural area close to, to the city. Uh, although she had normal deliveries at home before, this time she decided to go to the local hospital in Huancabelica. After an apparent normal labor and delivery, she kept bleeding, and her uterus was not contracting well. So, a partial placental retention was suspected. She was taken to the operating room for a manual removal of, of the extraction of, of the placenta and curettage. During that procedure and the sedation, she was surgically sterilized. Again, the doctor responsible claimed that this was medically indicated. Her baby died secondary to some hemolytic problems a week after. During the years 1995 and 1998, more than 250,000 women, Peruvian women, were surgically sterilized, many of them without her consent. All of this was part of an aggressive state and sponsor family planning campaign. The majority of women survived the event, carrying not only surgical scars. Others died like Maria. She was 32 from a rural area close to the city of Piura. This is north of Peru. For weeks, she received pressure from healthcare providers from her community health center to get a surgical sterilization. She had seven pregnancies. She was happy with hormonal birth control. She was never seen by a doctor before the surgery. She was never told of the potential risk of anesthesia or sedation. After a surgical sterilization, she developed a rapid neurological deterioration, dying after a few days. No aut autopsy was ever done on her, but was most likely to cerebral edema. Today in Peru, after 15 years of these terrible events, no one can deny that during those years, severe and serious violations of the dignity of Peruvian women did take place. All of these human rights violations were part of a state intervention, as I said before, and were all performed by Peruvian doctors and nurses. All of them were surgeries performed in operating rooms by licensed Peruvian physicians. But why do doctors and nurses get involved in, in this type of acts? Can we say that all of those involved are just bad doctors or rotten apples? It's just because they are ignorant of medical ethics or ethical principles. But more importantly, can, how can we prevent this from happening again? My experience in the years that I have worked for the Ombudsman Office is that listening to these stories, and especially for, to the interpretation of, of, that every side has from the events, can give you some light into the reasons behind these terrible acts and how to prevent them from happening again. And that is quite important if the goal of all of us is to make sure that healthcare providers respect patient values, preferences, and needs. Now let me tell you about a little bit how Peruvian healthcare providers remember the forced sterilizations of the 1990s with the help of another story. And this is a story that includes something that happened in late 2011. 
we were at the end of a bitter political campaign. You're not Peruvian, so you don't know who, who are in the picture, but I'm going to tell you. This was uh, a tight race between these two persons that are in, in, the, in the picture. Both of them were going to the second round of Alotage. One of them is our current president, Mr. Ollantumala, and his rival at that moment, Mrs. Keiko Fujimori. A week before the runoff, election day, during the final televised debate, Mr. Ollantumala opened the debate by reminding Keiko Fujimori of the events of forced sterilizations during, that happened during the government of her father. For a person like me, that has been involved in, in the investigation of these human rights violations for years, this was important, quite relevant. But the truth is that that, that time, that by that time in 2011, most denounces of forced sterilization had been declared prescribed to be followed by the Peruvian judicial system. This was not a topic for most of the media, and was really just part of the agenda of a few, a few human rights NGOs and groups close to a Peruvian congresswoman from Cusco that you can see in, in the picture on the right side, it's called Hilaria Supa. But you know that political campaign advisors do not choose this type of denounces by chance. And in light of the results of that election, no one can deny that the use of this particular issue had a significant influence on the election outcome. The week following the debate was of in intense discussions about the forced sterilization that happened 15 years back. Just one day after the debate, in a statement to a local television cable channel, a congressman and physician, advisor for Mrs. Fujimori, said that the denounces of forced sterilizations were attributable only to physicians' professional misconduct. The next day, the Peruvian Medical College placed a declaration in most print and virtual media presenting their interpretations of the facts. And as I said before, today in Peru it's impossible to deny the occurrence of the events of forced sterilizations. So the Peruvian Medical College Declaration implicitly admitted the occurrence of the abuses and characterized those events as damage to health, harm to the rights of human and human dignity, and erosions of ethics and medical deontology. Then the Peruvian Medical College went to contextualize the abuses as the result of a policy that established mandatory targets from the central level. I can add here that this contextualization of the events is not exclusive to medical doctors. When referring to the forced sterilization abuses in, of the 1990s, almost unanimously, Peruvian healthcare professionals tend to contextualize the abuses, even when opinions are made from organizations that ad advocate for, for patients' rights. Now, what is the, this argument of, of contextualizations? I can summarize as this. The forced sterilization crimes were a result of a policy designed to prioritize the sterilizations over other fertility control methods. And this happened within a health system where physicians and other healthcare professionals were threatened to get involved. The main evidence of this has been shown as the existence of official communications of required quotas for sterilizations. Now, before I continue, let me, let me put something clear that is clear for me. In, it's an undeniable fact that uh, healthcare professionals that work in public service in countries like Peru develop their work in suboptimal conditions. They have low wages, they have uh, poor training, lack of incentives, they have infrastructure problems, uh, they have technical limitations. Uh, in addition, it should be noted that these prof professionals are also citizens of the countries where they develop their work, and with all the limitations that that entails. What I'm trying to show here is that Peruvian physicians and nurses, and in general, healthcare providers, find reasonable to, ar to argue that these conditions explain why political pressures generated the abuses. But it's important to notice that with this argument, they do just not avoid placing themselves in the uncomfortable position of perpetrators of, of crimes, but also manage to rank themselves as victims 
of an evil system. But what did the general public think? Let me, let me go back to the post-debate days. During the week following the presidential debate, the media close to one of the candidates made sure the voices of the victims were heard. Some of the NGOs responsible for bringing the cases to international organizations act as sounding boards. And what I'm showing you is, is some of the front pages of, of major newspapers. And the one on the bo bottom right is a demonstration, an artist demonstration around forced solicitation that happened just during that, that week. But with the except of the opinion of the Peruvian Medical College during that week, contextualized discussions of the issue were not apparent. Well, if you think from, from the perspective of an electoral strategy, this probably was due to the enormous emotional weight carried by the stories of women sterilized against their will. At the end, the result was that with the exception of healthcare providers, many Peruvians when confronted with the narrative of the stories of forced sterilizations considered that what happened in the 90s were terrible and inexcusable crimes and voted against it. Now, why healthcare providers in this case and other cases have a tendency to contextualize the abuses? Well, the answer for that is not simple and, and includes the logical construction of, of a non-self-incriminatory discourse. But even that type of thinking, although it's not excusable, maybe more expect, expected at the individual level when you're trying to defend your, just yourself. In this case, it's quite remarkable the structural absence of any sensitivity or intention to apologize or to ask for forgiveness of the main group of people that was implicated in the abuses. And this includes the medical a a academia. Now, over the past 10 years, I have heard plenty of arguments of Peruvian healthcare providers against the idea of recognizing the responsibility and apologizing for facts as, as forced sterilizations, mainly because it will not solve the structural problems of, of the, within the health system. On the contrary, usually it's argued that it, is, uh, it will be appropriate to understand that the health services need to be improved with better work and infrastructure conditions. But Peruvian healthcare professionals, I think this is also applied to, because I know experiences from Eastern Europe that are quite, quite similar, uh, need to remember that women who were forcefully sterilized perceived that they were victims of something that for them, and for many Peruvians here, and for many people around the world, I think for the majority of us, is an excusable affront to their dignity. And if the intent is to address the structural problems on the health system, first doctors and nurses should advocate for the victim's effective ability to freely exercise their rights, such as demanding justice. Secondly, they should recognize crime as such without making excuses or contextualizing the abuses. It's my opinion that offering apologies is, and asking for forgiveness should be part of this process. But offering apologies will be certainly uncomfortable especially for a group of individuals such as physicians who highly value their actions. Now what cases like this tell me is that maybe this is time for Western medical doctors to re-examine our scale of values and, and the fact that we may not be in synchrony with the outside world. Maybe what is morally relevant for us, maybe not be so for the rest. But do Western do medical doctors have a different scale of values than the rest of the people. Well, that's, that's something that always had, I, I have the feeling that, that we, we are in, not in synchrony. And let me, let me explore that with you with another story. This happened in 2007, and there was a big earthquake in August 2007 that hit the cities of Chincha and Pisco, these two beautiful cities 200 kilometers south of Lima. Now, as part of the emergency intervention, the Ministry of Health uh, designed an immunization campaign that included yellow fever vaccination. Although this is not an area of the endemic yellow fever, or even had a case report in the last several decades, the campaign was launched. In a country where its state usually communicates with its citizens in non-democratic manners, 
A prevention campaign like this often turns into mandatory vaccination. Nurses go out to apply vaccines. An ideal coverage estimate is rapidly turned into a mandatory quota. A few days after the initiation of the vaccination campaign, reports came of people dying from the vaccine. A total of four people died within a couple of weeks of the campaign start. It's known today that the four cases were secondary to a viscerotropic disease following yellow fever vaccination, which is a fatal uh, adverse reaction in which the attenuated virus turns into, into a wild type and, and, and mimics natural, naturally acquired yellow fever. Two of the individuals that died had contraindication for the vaccine because of immunosuppression <clears throat> and were classified as programmatic errors by the public health specialist from the, from the World Health Organization in charge of the investigation, which is, I think, one of the, the, the things that I always see from, from public health people that they tend to, to name medical negligence in some, some special way. After two weeks, the campaign was stopped. Experts were gathered. Reports were made. As of today, no medical authority has ever sent apologies in private or public to the relatives of the dead of the people in Chinch on the people on Ch in Chinch and Pisco. There has been no public recognition of responsibility of this public health mistake by any authority. There has been no interaction with relatives other than institutions like the one that I, that I work. Now, every time I, I push things this, this way, I, I always ask, ask me the question, am I being too hard with my colleagues here? I, I, you, you can consider that public health specialists that run and, and see these disasters and, and problems and do the, all the research are just doing their job, and there's no obligation to apologize for every adverse event that, that, that is part for a public health intervention. Although this is dramatic, this is part of the thing that we see as medical doctors, as medical professionals. This is what we are trained for. Now, just think again of, of, of what I just said. We have four people that died. The cream of the cream of vaccine experts of this part of the world get gathered, and this is true. They came all, all here. They got the involvement of, of several infectious disease experts from, from several nations, Brazilians, they came from the US, they got the samples and they got them analyzed in labs in Lima, in Brazil. They sent it to the CDC in Atlanta. But during all that period of months of, of investigation, no expert, local or foreign, approaches the relatives to explain them what had happened. And by the way, Peace Conchinche are quite accessible. They, they have a nice road that you can get there in two hours from Lima. And everything ends the same way any other significant medical event ends with a paper in a major journal. Now, a year after these deaths, in 2008, another vaccination campaign was launched. As a country, we have very high prevalence of hepatitis B. This is a public health problem in Peru. So an ambitious campaign was the sign of adult hepatitis B vaccination. This started in April 2008. Millions of dollars of something that is called the rotatory fund for, for vaccines that we have in, in Latin America were allocated to cover the three doses of this vaccine. The target population was close to 10 million adults. Like a couple of weeks after the start of the campaign, a representative of a dubious medical organization presented in some media stating that the vaccine being used contained timerosol and that was an element related to autism. Again, as always, governmental authorities, academic medical institutions, and professional organizations stood together to make unanimous statements around the safety of the vaccines and the need of vaccination. Unfortunately, the result was expected. The number of people that completed the required three doses was way below the goal. They even didn't publish the third, the third dose. But even healthcare providers from state institutions who were initially va vaccinated massively, it's calculated around 90% of them got the first dose, didn't show for the, for the next doses with a, with a return rate of around of less than 30%. As you may expect, hepatitis B remains one of the Peruvian main public health problems, and last year we launched another 
uh, campaign. Now, what can we learn from these stories? During the years that I helped the, the Ombudsman office, I reviewed thousands of cases. Most of them were not these stories, were more health-related individual complaints. Cannot deny that I am still affected when I remember some of these cases, especially by the express expressions of anger and frustration that these mostly low-income Peruvian citizens had like, towards their, their doctors and, and healthcare providers. But, but equally shocking was to notice that doctors and nurses at any level were too frequently clueless about why these complaints originated. Too often the same story had two absolutely different versions. Too often the only trigger for a complaint was the quest for the truth of what happened. During those years, I did interact with medical doctors in several ways. I read the reports about the cases that we were reviewing. I did interviews with authorities and even did quite a, quite a number of workshops around, around the country. From this interaction, I can say that although what, what is said in, in, the, in, in the slide that I'm showing that is a, a shocking statement from, from one head of, of the department in Lima, but from this interaction, I, I can say that most medical doctors that I, that I spoke to, see our, and, and I include myself, see, we see ourselves as well-intended individuals convinced of doing the right thing for the right reason. But at the same time, we have an, a structural blindness to see ourselves as part of any problem in healthcare. This blindness tends, tends us to medicalize most of the changes that we are involved in, part due to our fear, I think, to lose power. Now, I consider that, that changes like shared decision-making, minimal disruptive medicine are paths to closing the gap between doctors and patients. But as any, as any other movement that originates from medicine, it is absolutely important to make sure that this, it is not medicalized. How we do this, what well, is that part of the reason you, you people meet and you, you do your research? Now, what, can, what else can uh, uh, somebody that is more, more close to the human rights uh, movement can suggest you, where well, I can throw some, some final ideas. First, I have to tell you that when, when I first saw this, this cover, I felt disappointed. And, and, and this, is, this is absolutely true. When I saw it, I, I, I saw a lot of people that was um, not happy, but impressed by, by the impact of this image. But w when I saw this cover, the first thing that came to my mind was, well, a, a patient re revolution portrayed as a red fist embedded in 20th century totalitarian iconography. Well, this is, this is not something that, that I'm, 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 I'm really happy about. I am a citizen of a country that has suffered from totalitarian ideologies. I cannot imagine putting this type of ad in, in a hospital ward. They will think that it's, it's part of some propaganda from, from, a, from one of the Maoist groups that we, we used to have and we still have. But I think my, my suggestion here is you have to be aware that historical contexts do exist. We, we, we live in a world that, that this type of iconography has been uh, attached to suffering and, 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 and death and, and really bad times around, around several countries. So, uh, but more important than, than, than the use of, of images, and, or as important as the use of images, I will say that do, do patients really want a red fist up revolution? Well, it's my experience that, that even when medical doctors have, were perpetrators of, of, of crimes, like the forced sterilization examples that I just, just showed you, the victims have not blamed us. What I know is that patients want a change in the way we practice medicine. Patients want to be respected and recognized as wh what they already are. They want doctors to help them solve their problems, doctors to talk about their fears, to be with them when they are sick, and counsel them to go after their dreams. But as, and, and I'm aware that as any structural change that involves of the respect of, of a fundamental right and autonomy and, and, and respect of dignity is, is a fundamental right, the implementation of, of shared decision making will have an a, a element of confrontation, but it needs to be clarified that this is not a confrontation between 
patients with the help of the good doctors against the bad doctors. The stories that of, of human rights abuses in healthcare can tell us that medicine is a complex process with no clear dividing lines between the good and the bad doctors. So we are the problem and our social contract mandates that we have to change. For that, we need to understand our limitations. We need to redefine our goals. And, but more importantly, we need to understand, despite of whatever a transplant surgeon may think, that we are also human beings. And that means that as important as good intentions, democratic values like due procedure, accountability, transparency might be part, must be part of our daily practice. And that means, like one of my favorite songs, that you can always get what you want. But if you try, sometimes you might find get what you need. <clears throat> Finally, I think more, more than thinking on, on, on revolutions uh, or guiding revolutions, the change to a medical practice that respects patients' values, preference, and express needs, like the one you, you are involved in and you propose in shared decision making, should be the one that let the patients really free. And, and I think that's, that's the end of, of, of what, what we, we should, our final goal will be in, in all these patient center uh, medicine that we are, we are hoping to achieve around the globe. Thank you. Okay. We have time for some questions. We have the microphones. Hi, uh, Marla Clayman from Northwestern University in Chicago. Um, I want to thank you for, um, for your presentation as well as for the work that you've done related to human rights. I think it's, um, I can't overstate how fundamentally important it is. And I, I want to bring up something where when you said something about the physicians not, um, you know, sort of seeing it as their just role in practice to, to do some of the things that they'd done, it reminded me um, a lot of the, the sort of anthropological idea of the other, right? And so that because many of the physicians see themselves um, or potentially see themselves as really so different from the people that they are serving, um, that 